الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين شفيع المذنبين حبيب الله العالمين بالقاسم المصطفى محمد صل على وعلى محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الحكيم وهو أستك القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل لو أنتم تملكون خزائن رحمة ربي إذا لأمسكتم خشية 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 للإنف خشية الإنفاق وكان الإنسان قتورا آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات ما صل على السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته I begin in the name of Allah, the most kind, the most merciful. It's due to that kindness and mercy that we have these opportunities where we gather in remembrance and glorification of Him, Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. Then we send our condolences to our 12th and living Imam, al Hujja, and to each and every one of you as we gather this evening to commemorate the wafat anniversary of Sharikatul Hussein, Aqilatul Bani Hashim, Sayyidatul Zainab, Alayha. Alayhima afdalu salatu was salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. We pray to Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala that we each get an opportunity to go for the ziyarat of Sayyidah in Sham and that we receive her shafaat in the hereafter, insha'Allah. Before we begin with uh, the discussion today, as a follow up from the the New Zealand attack that happened last Friday we touched upon it last Sunday so I don't want to go through those points again but alhamdulillah we've developed quite a few relationships with different faith centers around uh, Peel area and we received a call today that uh, the priest or the canon uh, from St. Peter's Anglican Church would like to come and uh, show her support to us tomorrow so as you come for Juma tomorrow you may see one person, you may see more people out here. Do welcome them as they're here to show us their support and um, to stand guard for us, inshallah. So that kind of um, relationship is appreciated and that kind of relationship should be respected. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. We're gathered to, to talk about Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam and there's no doubt that um, she serves as an inspiration uh, for all of us, right? Um, the beauty of the Ahlul Bayt, you know, and, and their family is that they're not, they're not role models who are gender specific, you know? So you can't say that women can't look at Imam Ali and say, well, he's a man. No, he's still the Imam, you know? Um, and same, when we look at the, the female role models that we have from the Ahlul Bayt, whether it is, say, the Fatima, whether it is, say, the Fatima al qum say, the Zainab, say, the Umm Kulthum, um, no man should ever think that these are not for us. Because whatever they did, they did what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expected them to do, regardless of gender. Um, and so these are important um, role models that we have and when we look at Sayyidah salam in particular I think that we all have a soft spot in our hearts for her you know we all do because of what she did the way she did it um, this beautiful life um, of Zainab salam came into this world according to certain accounts either on the fifth of Hijrah or on the sixth year of Hijrah so whether it was 345 or 346, there is a little bit of discussion regarding that. But the traditions do tell us that when she was born, our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad, was out of town. And when he returned back 
as was his custom, he would go to the house of Fatima first. And when he came to the house of his daughter, فَقَالَ لَهُ أَمِيرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ وَهَبَ لِبْنَتِكَ فَاطِمَ بِنْتَ فَاخْتَارَ لَهَا إِسْمَا He says to him, Ya Rasulullah, Allah has gifted your daughter Fatima a daughter. So we would like you to name this child now. Um, there's beautiful adab, you know, we could spend a lot of time focusing on that. But there's beautiful adab that is there, you know, as far as the respect that was given to Rasulullah. More so than anything, um, I don't think we should look at it from a cultural thing where we say then we can have the grandfather name all of our children. That's not what this hadith tells us. But it tells us that from the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam khasatan specifically, um, they all looked up to Rasulullah. And they waited for guidance from Rasulullah because that was the expectation, right? And so we have to look at it not only from that perspective, but what our responsibility is towards Allah. That when we are in a situation where we are doubtful of what to do, we look towards them for guidance, the way they look towards Rasulullah for guidance. So the Prophet replies back and says, فَقَالَ وَإِنِّي أَنْتَذِرُ وَحْيَ رَبِّي فِي تَسْمِيَتِهَا he says, and you wait for me, while you are waiting for me to name her, I am waiting from a wahi, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to name this child. وَإِذَا بِجِبْرَيْلْ يَنْزِلُ مِنَ sama. And at that time, Jibrail came down onto earth, and he says to him, As-salam yakhussuka bis-salam. That's like, a, you hear this line all the time, it's such a beautiful line, yeah? He says, salam, as-salam gives you salam. Yeah? And we know salam is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? And so this is a very beautiful way of that salam coming directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so he says that the salam has sent upon you salam and he has said to you, Sam al mauludi bi ismi Zainab. He says, Name this child Zainab. Fakad katabnahu laha fil lawhil mahfuz. For it is written, on the arsh or the lawhil mahfuz, the guarded tablet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَضَمَّهَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَىٰ صَدْرِ وَقَبِلَ مَا بَيْنَ عَيْنَيْهَا وَسَمَّاهَا بِإِسْمِ زَيْنَاب Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Ha, salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And it is with this beauty that she came into this earth. Um, and she lived this life of beauty. Um, where indeed what we see from her is beauty all around. And when she received her wafat or she received um, her calling back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again there are different accounts of when that happened. But the one that is generally agreed upon is that she left this world on a night like this, the 15th of Rajab in the year 62 after Hijra. So a year and a half after Karbala, uh, she left this world. As far as how she died, um, where she died even and where she is buried um, there is a lot of aqwal on that you know and I don't want to bring about a sense of confusion within our gatherings for that uh, what we do know is that the most famous maqam for her is in Sham and that is where our scholars will also go visit her in Sham and that is where we consider her to be buried Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad Salli ala when we look at the life of Zainab alayhi salam, we are left with a tremendous legacy. You know, a legacy um, that allows us to learn and emulate her. Especially considering the, the difficulties and the trials that she had to endure in the course of her life. Um, from, the t from the fact that she and her sister were the only ones who saw um, the, uh, the whole Ahlul Kisa get get martyred in front of them. You know, this is why she is known as Ummul Masaib, right? One of the reasons is because of all the musibah and all the difficulties that she has witnessed. Um, and then we come to the whole saga of Karbala and then we come to the events that led past Karbala to where um, she was taken as a prisoner. And we know the history of Zainab alayhi salam, right? Um, yet, you know, when we look at these events, I'm always, this is where I always get inspiration from her, and I think we do too, is that these events never, we never find that these events made her act in a way that God would not be proud of. You know what I mean? Um, you know, someone cuts us off and we might yell something. You know, someone 
uh, doesn't do something that we like and we might get frustrated. Um, our spouses may do something and we get into an argument with them. And none of that comes even close to what Zainab salam had to go through. None of that. But never do we see her responding in a manner that God would not be pleased with. Um, and I think that that's a tremendous lesson of control that we can learn from Zainab. And that's where we have to get to that stage of Iman. Um, and inshallah, we'll, 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 we're going to get there. I have no doubt, you know, inshallah, we're going to get there. But to be that level of Iman where you are that steady rock, you know, no matter what winds come, no matter what storms come, no matter what weathers hit that rock, the rock remains a rock. It will have the bruises of their environment. Yeah? When something hits that rock, it will bruise the rock. Right? We're not saying we have to be uh, rock-like emotionally. That's not what we're saying. But what we're talking about is being steady. Right? And so that we're not happy one day, sad one day, um, upset another day, overjoyed another day. These emotional roller coasters that we as human beings go through take a toll on us. Right? Take a toll on us. The ups and downs that we go through um, often lead people to a lot of different issues that they have to deal with. But if you're steady and you don't get overexcited as something happens, you don't get too down when something bad happens, then your ups and downs even aren't that big. You understand? Right? Because you're steady. So it's not, it's not like it's mattering how high the wave is or how low the tides are. Your ups and downs aren't that big because you're the steady force that everyone relies upon. And I think when we look at her life, we, we learn this lesson, right? Um, about our responsibility of always doing what God wants us to do. And this is what I want to tie back to our discussion. Um, when we, we've been talking about stinginess, al-bukhul, for the last three lectures. And turns out it's a long discussion because there are seven lectures on this subject of bukhul. But it's quite fascinating what God has to say about stinginess. If you've missed the first three lectures, you've missed some beautiful lectures, I gotta tell you. Yeah? But you gotta go back and listen to it. We're not trying to recap all of these things. Um, what we want to talk about is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects us um, to be open-handed. Right? Now we're not just talking about money, right? So we're talking about open-handed with everything, specifically our akhlaq. That means I'm not stingy with my akhlaq. I greet everybody with a smile. I greet everybody warmly. Um, I, I, I return salams. I recite salawat. When the pro All of these are part of our akhlaqi expectations. And when I withhold my akhlaq from someone else, I'm considered being stingy in the eyes of God. It also has to do with your time, your effort. right? How much you're willing to put into the greater good. This is that, uh, and, I, and I say this, knowing some people may not like it, but like when you look at how much you're willing to give your mosque, for example, like this mosque, right? Um, everybody and their mom has a suggestion. This is how the program should be. This is how this should be. This is how long Maulana should talk for. This is, and then at the end of the day, you're going to be like, are you going to work? And they'll be like, no, no, I'm not going to work, right? You're being stingy. You're being stingy. In the eyes of God, when you're not willing to do the work and to put in that effort that's required for your community to blossom, you're being stingy. These are examples of stinginess. It's not always about money, right? But money is a big part of it. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to do when we compare that to Zainab alayhi salam is that God is going to try us with different things, right? Um, and he wants to see if we remain open-handed or we turn towards stinginess, you know, to, to close down. So like when God tries us with something, like if it's my tabi'ah um, to, um, I don't know, smile at people, for example, right? And then something bad happens to me. So as I'm driving to mosque, I get pulled over. La qaddar Allah, inshallah. Yeah, inshallah, that doesn't happen, inshallah. Um, but I get pulled over and so obviously that upsets my mood, right? But that's a challenge from God. Now it was my mistake that I got pulled over. Maybe I was going fast, whatever it is, right? Um, but it was my mistake. But how does that affect the way I deal with God's creation? That's what God wants to see. That's honestly what God wants to see. 
Trials and tests from God are simply to see the results of those actions. Not, not, not anything else. And so we always have to be open-handed. Because that's what God expects from us. And interestingly, right? That's how God behaves with us. Isn't it? Yeah, like if you think about it, um, no matter what I do, God's still kind to me. It's amazing. It's amazing the kindness of God. It's amazing the mercy of God, right? That you have in this world people who don't even believe in God, yet God gives them air to breathe. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. We got to appreciate that. You know what I mean? And worse than that, worse than that would be someone like me who claims to believe in God and then sin on top of that. That's worse than a kafir sinning, I'm telling you. Right? Because I have professed iman and then I still end up sinning. And even though I end up sinning, God still wakes me up in the morning. Subhanallah. Right? Subhanallah. Right? If you get into like a fight with your kid, right? And your kid like is sleeping, you'll be like, ah, let that kid sleep. Yeah, I don't want to wake him up. Right? I don't want to deal with that right now. But that's not what God does. God still wakes us up. Hey Baba, go get your risk. Hey Baba, go do this. And I've been so horrible to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But God's showing us something. That no matter what happens to you, no matter what people do to you, you don't change. You be consistent. Right? And this is where we are always, we're told in hadith, تَخَلَّقُوا بِأَخْلَاقِ اللَّهِ أَحْسَنْتْ yeah? That adopt the akhlaq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The way God deals with us and the way God conducts himself with us is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects us to conduct ourselves with other people. And so in the last lecture, when specifically we're talking about stinginess, um, we were discussing how can I tell if I'm stingy, right? Um, so of course when I say I, y'all don't look at me only, yeah? look at yourselves. Um, but how can you tell if you're stingy? Um, and we discussed one half of it. And the, the first point is that the person will be filled with excuses. If you make excuses for everything, right? Um, that's an alama, that's a sign of stinginess. Amirul Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. He says, Al Bakhil mutahajiju bil ma'adir wa ta'alil. That the miser justifies himself by presenting many excuses and justifications. Yeah? Many excuses. And so we discussed the first half of that, right? The first example we gave is of an excuse that I just don't have enough, right? Baba, I just don't have enough time. I wish I had more time. If I had more time, I would do it, right? I would do it. But I just don't have enough. Ask God to add an hour. Yeah, we all, yeah, that's a beautiful line, right? Ask God to do that. Oh, I just don't have enough money, right? If, if God made me richer, I'd give more, right? Um, and we gave an example from the Qur'an about that and what Allah says about people who think like that, right? Um, but we see the fallacy in that and what God and what we are told is um, if you are busy making excuses now, you'll make excuses no matter what your life condition becomes. And no matter what it is, you become rich, you'll make, you'll make excuses. You have more time, you'll make excuses. God doesn't want to see us with what we can do with more, God wants to see what we can do with what we have now. That's what He wants to see. Because all of us would think that if I had more, I'd do more. You know? But the fact is God wants to see, like I gave Jafar this much. What's Jafar going to do with it? And if Jafar just makes excuses, then I don't care what God gives me, I'll always make excuses. So the first one is excuses. That if you find yourself constantly making excuses, um, you got to look deeper into that and see that maybe there's a problem of stinginess that I have. And again, like I know when I say stingy, um, money comes into mind right away. But maybe that is, but it could be many other areas. Another example of excuses. So excuses is, comes up in two parts. The first part is that if I had more, I would do more. Um, the second example of excuses is more about justification for my actions. So I will justify my actions. So for example, um, I, I'll say, like, I don't give more. I mean, I would give more. You know, I honestly would. Alhamdulillah, God has given me a lot. 
I would, I would give more, but I'm planning for my future. You know, my retirement, my children's RESPs, you know. And because I got a plan for all of these things, you know, I can't look after everything, right? So I have justified my action, but I justify it very beautifully. So it's not just that I say that I got a plan for my future. Um, I'll justify it by saying, look, God's given me an intellect. And the intellect tells me I got a plan for my family. And so this is from God, what I'm doing. So I've justified it with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I've used the God stamp, you know, the God stamp because God said so, alaykum salam, right? But I've justified it. Um, and that justification makes a lot of sense in my mind because when I add these things together, it makes perfect sense what I'm doing, isn't it? I'm looking after my well-being. Um, I don't do more for others. I don't do more for the community because honestly, my kids are young and I'm looking after my kids, right? Like I'm looking after their welfare and I'm looking after their needs. And, and this is what Allah wants me to do. Allah doesn't want us to neglect our families. So I have justified my stinginess of not giving to the community by, by justifying it. Right? By saying, but this is what God wants us to do. God says, family, family, family. Right? Look after your family. And so, in my mind, um, I, am, I am doing something right. You understand? Um, another example would be that I don't share with others. Um, like, let's say my knowledge. Let's say I have knowledge, but I'm not willing to share my knowledge with others. Um, why? Because God says, Talabul ilm faridha. God says, go and seek knowledge. So I'm going to go seek knowledge. And so I've sought this knowledge, um, but I'm still seeking more because God says it's an obligation. So with all of these things, the justification can become very dangerous. Um, and these are just some examples that I gave. I'm sure you could think of more examples. But justifications become very dangerous because, we all, because it feels like I'm doing something positive. Right? I'm taking care of my family, I'm planning for their retirement, I'm planning for my retirement, their education, I'm giving them more attention, I'm doing all of these things. And because I feel like I'm doing positive, I never once think that I'm actually being stingy in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? How does Allah respond to that? Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran in Surah number 3 verse number 180, Allah says, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ يَبْخَلُونَ بِمَا آتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ هُوَ خَيْرٌ لَهُمْ بَلْ هُوَ شَرٌ لَهُمْ Allah says, and let not those think who are stingy in giving in the way of Allah. Yeah? Out of which Allah has granted them in the first place. Allah has given us that wealth. Allah has given us that time. Allah has given us that knowledge. Allah has given us all of these things. Correct? Allah says, don't let not those people think who are being stingy out of what I have given them, that it is good for them. Allah says, nay, it is worse for them. It is actually bad for them. They think they're doing good. But Allah says they're not doing good. They're actually doing harm to themselves. Then Allah continues, لَهُمْ سَيُطَوِّقُونَ مَا بَخِلُوا بِهِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَلِلَّهِ مِرَاثِ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Allah says they shall have that which they were stingy of made cleave to their neck on the day of judgment. Yeah? Like you weren't willing to give your time because you... We're looking for, so you're looking for your own time. You were looking at yourself, your own family. Allah will make that stick to your neck on the Day of Judgment. You'll be held paraded with that. Was it money, wealth, time, and whatever it is. However God does it. But that's the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how do we balance that, right? Like we have to remember. We have to remember um, that whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, whatever He has given us, there are multi-layered expectations with what God has given us. There is a personal need that needs to be fulfilled. Okay? But on top of that, there is a responsibility that we have to look after the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have that responsibility. We are not isolational creation, creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We all have this responsibility to look after each other. You know, there is this notion that we'll come to. Um, 
and I, they will come to in the in the coming lectures. But we sometimes feel that I've got to look after myself, and Allah will look after others. When Allah says, "I look after you," you look after others. You understand? Yeah, that's how society works. If all of us just said, I'm going to look after myself, society would come to a stop. Right? But when we look after others, God looks after us. And that's the expectation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. And to find that balance, it's not easy. Right? It's not easy. If being a believer was easy, we would all be tremendous believers. Yeah? But being a believer is not easy. Being a, being a believer the way we're expected to be believers is hard work. And a lot of that life is trying to find that balance between what I have to do and what God wants me to do. And obviously whatever God wants me to do will supersede that, right? But at the same time trying to find that balance between meeting my own needs and meeting the needs of others. And this is where um, we need like a boost of Iman, okay? Like the answers of how to fix these problems are, are, are just simple. Um, simple to say. Simple to say. I didn't finish the sentence. Increase your Iman. I got to increase my Iman. Once I've increased my Iman, I will know what God expects from me. I will know God what wants me to do. And I'll know how to balance correctly. And this is what we see in Zainab alayhi salam. Yeah? We see this balance of life where not only did she make sure that her children were looked after in Karbala, but she made sure that everyone's children were looked after in Karbala. Yeah? Not only did she make sure that she provided spiritual nourishment to herself, but she made sure that she provided spiritual nourishment to whoever came in contact with her. Yeah? This is that balance that we learn from Zainab. Yeah, and this is where we have to take her as this beautiful role model. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Tonight we remember the Masaib of Zainab. And you know there are so many aspects to this Masaib of Zainab. That just flow with me and where my heart takes me today. I tried to think where it would be hardest for Zainab. I wonder if it was hardest for her when, when she had to send her children off to battle. You know, it is said that on the day of Ashura, Zainab dressed her children. And she said, go make me proud. Go and make me proud. It is said the children would go to Imam al Hussein and Imam al Hussein would send them back and says, I cannot do this to my sister Zainab. And every time they would come back to Zainab, Zainab would say, Why haven't you gone yet? Why do you not fulfill my own desires and why have you not gone? They would say, Oh, our mother, our uncle will not allow us to go. There came a time, Khutaba say, that on the day of Ashura, the Imam al Hussein is standing and he sees Aun and Muhammad coming, but he sees Zainab coming alongside. Imam looks down for he knows that he would not be able to say no to Zainab. It is said that they say that Zainab looks at Hussein and says, Ya Akhi Hussein, have I ever asked you for anything in my life? Have I ever asked you for anything in my life? Imam al Hussein shook his head, no. And then he gave her permission, gave her children permission to go. I wonder if that was difficult. I wonder if it was difficult when Aliyun al Akbar fell and she saw the grief on the face of Abu Abdullah. That when Aliyun al Akbar called out, Alayka minni salam. She saw the whiteness from the eyes of Hussein go away. I wonder if that was difficult for Zainab. I wonder if it was difficult when she saw Hussein bidding farewell to Abu al-Fazl al-Abbas. You know, it is said when Abbas came to Imam al-Hussein and he said, Akhi, allow me to go. 
Hussein alayhi salam responds, Abbas, you are the flag bearer of my army. Abbas responds, Mawla, besides you and I, there is no one to. Hussein says, As Abbas, before you go, go and bid farewell to your sister Zainab. It is said, Abbas comes to the tent of Zainab. The women and children gather around and start crying. Hutaba say that Zainab looked at Abbas and said, Abbas, since I was a child, I would been told that there will come a day when my hijab will be removed. There will come a day when water will be cut off, when Hussein will be killed. And as I grew up, and as I saw you grow up, I would think to myself, that one who has a brother like Abbas, how could anything happen? <coughs> but now that you are going, Abbas, I know that this is true. I wonder if that was difficult for Zayn. Then we come to the farewell wida of Imam al Hussein. <laughs> the farewells were the most difficult, my brothers and sisters, because you knew that this was the end now. It is said when Hussein bid farewell to everyone, he climbed upon his horse. And as he was starting to go, he heard a familiar voice from behind saying, Mohalan, Mohalan, Yabn al Zahra, that, O oh, son of Zahra, wait for one more minute. <laughs> Imam al Hussein comes down and sees his sister Zainab. Ah, oh, he comes towards Zainab and says, Zainab, we have bid farewell already. Zainab says, Oh, my brother, I remembered now. I remembered that during the final days of our mother's life together, my mother called me and said, Zainab, there will come a day when Hussein will be bidding farewell to you. I want you to call him close to you and kiss his neck, for that is where swords will come down. And so Zainab kissed the neck of Imam al Hussein. I wonder if that was difficult for Zainab. But Zainab still had much more to see, my brothers and sisters. Zainab had to be taken as prisoner. But we come to Shami Gariba now. We come to the night of Shami Gariba when these Malounin, after they had slaughtered Aba Abdullah, after they had trampled on the body of Aba Abdullah, they come and burn the tents of the women and children. And the responsibility fell upon the shoulders of Zainab. We can't even imagine, my brothers and sisters, but the Musiba of Zainab breaks the heart of the Ahlul Bayt. By God, it is said, when the enemies of Imam al Sadiq burned the house of Imam al Sadiq, Imam al Sadiq was seen crying for days after that. Their companions would come to Imam al Sadiq and they would say, Yabna Rasulillah, this is not the first house that was burned of the Ahlul Bayt. He says, Wallah, what you say is true. This was not our first house to be burned. But when they burned my house, I saw how the women and children in my house ran from one corner to another, not knowing where to go. He says, at that time, I thought of my aunt Zainab in Karbala and what she had to go through. My brothers and sisters, what Zainab had to go through was the most difficult for Imam al-Sajjad to bear, was the most difficult for the Ahlul Bayt to bear. We are told in Ziyaratul Nahiya, our 12th Imam says, وَلَمْ أَكُنْ لِمَنْ حَارَبَكَ muhariba." He says, even if I was not there to fight those who fought you, O Hussein, فَلَأَنْدُبَنَّكَ سَبَاحًا he says, but I will cry for you day and night. But then he adds, Wala abkiyanna laka badali dumu'i dama. Our sahib al zaman, may Allah give him relief on this night. May Allah comfort his heart on this night. He says, I cry for you. He says, I cry for you so much that my tears have turned to blood now. It is said 
A scholar saw the twelfth Imam in his dream. He says to him, Ya Mawla, what made you cry blood instead of tears? Is it the musiba of your uncle Abbas? He says, No, Allah, if Abbas had seen this, Abbas would have cried tears of blood. He says, is it the musibah of Ali Yunil Akbar? He says, no. He said, then it must be the musibah of Imam Al Hussein. He says, no. It is the musibah of my aunt Zainab <laughs> And what she had to endure from Karbala to Kufa and Kufa to Sham. Just bust a few more minutes of Masai, my brothers and sisters. Cry your heart out for Zainab. I tell you, these tears will come back to us. May Allah sacrifice us for the ihsan Zainab has done upon us. We are told that on the when Zainab alayhi salam was taken as a prisoner from Karbala, and as they were paraded through all the bodies on the plains of Karbala, they passed the body of Imam al Hussein, and it had been trampled, it had been beheaded. Zainab looks at the body of Imam al Hussein <laughs> and she said, Anta Akhil Hussein? Are you my brother Hussein? Our ulama tell us that when they came back after being taken as prisoners and when Zainab came back on Arba'iniya, she fell on the grave of Imam al Hussein. Our ulama say, I would not be surprised after all she had gone through if Imam al Hussein looks up and says, Auntie Are you my sister Zainab? What has happened to you? فَسَيَعْلَمُ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا أَيَّمُونَ قَلَبِي يَنْقَلِبُونَ وَالْعَاقِبَةُ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ مَاتَ مِعْ حُسَيْنِ